Dude, let's get it. Good to see you. I'm um, glad to have you on the show. Always, always wanted you on the show. And I go to, I used to go to Kansas so many times. I'd go to Kansas City once or twice a year. And I was like, oh, I'll just get him next time I go to Kansas City. Because I used to work at this comedy club called uh, Stanford and Sons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, okay, next time I go, I'm going to track him down. Because you were out of town the one time I was there. I was like, next time I go, I'm going to track him down. And then the guy that owned it died and the club went out of business. Where's Stanford and Sons in Kansas City? There Is it Rosa? It, it always moved because the guy, I, and I don't, I don't feel bad talking about him because he was almost like a character of like, like himself or like making fun of himself. But he's like a legendary Kansas City guy because he's, uh, he went to jail a bunch of times. Like there were three brothers, they're all dead now. All three of them, like one was a meth head, one was a crackhead, and one was like heroin. And they, uh, they were in and out of jail and everything was corrupt. Like you'd go to the comedy club, you, there would be fist fights and they were super racist. And, um, and they're like, you'd hear the brothers like yell to each other, but like seating the show, they're like, Craig, I got a whole group of black people. Where should I sit them? You know, like they, they were just the worst, like it, it, they were characters. They were so funny because they were just so wrong. It was like, this yeah, it's 20, 2019 this can't still be happening and uh <laughs> and no comedian wanted to work there and i would go just for the amusement i went every time i was like i i every time i had stories i would film them i was like this is incredible uh because th there aren't people like this anymore in the world but sure absolutely yeah the owner died so now i gotta have you on zoom yeah because you were gonna come here to can't see then COVID happened yeah yeah i mean that 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 took yeah, my, my touring schedule is gone. I, it's sure. non-existent. And now I'm like, Mr. Mom, I'm home with the kids all day long and I can hear my daughter out there. I'm going to tell her to shut the doors to the bus. Izzy, shut the doors to the bus. Um, yeah, this is a real professional show I do here. No, shut them. <laughs> shut them. Good job. Uh, so how are you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Uh, Hunter McIntyre says hello. I was with him yesterday. I did oh, his, yeah. Did you a big kiss for me? Big wet kiss? I did his 20-part workout. Um, it's just stupid. Just absolutely stupid. Idiot. No, it's, it's – I'm going to put down his workout template right now because I made a bet with him, and I have to do ads for him if, if, it, uh, if he wins the bet. And okay. So I've got to do eight, uh, four weeks of ads for him. And uh, he does. Look, if you're like you, I'm sure his workouts are great. But I'm an old man, and he had me squatting. Then, like, we did squats for a long time. Then we did shoulder press for a long time. Then we did sled pulls, push-ups, bike, pull-ups. I was like, dude, this is more volume than a games athlete does. Like, why are you doing this to me? I think he just does it to, like, impress me. Yeah, he, he, tomorrow, the next day he was just dead. He probably just laid around. He's like, oh, God, it was so bad. I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> oh, and, and he wore a weight vest while he did the whole thing. <laughs> he's like, he's like uh, wearing a weight vest while he's doing seated shoulder presses. I'm like, this doesn't, doesn't help. It was, uh, I remember when he first showed up at my house. Hadn't met him before. He and I both at that time were both working for Fit Aid as athletes. And Fit Aid was like, hey, we got this guy named Hunter McIntyre. He's coming around for open workouts in 2018. Uh, he's doing open workouts with different athletes. Uh, we want to send him to your house. It should be pretty fun. I said, okay, I don't know who this guy is. Old, old boy shows up, gets out of the car, like in, a, in the middle of Kansas. Leather jacket, you know, with the, the, the – uh, just. I don't even know how to explain. He looked like a dork, you know, like, but the thing about people in my life is that the people I love in my life are the people that know they might be a little bit different, but don't care. Yeah. They do it anyway. Yeah. And those are the best people. Cause you, that's the thing about Hunter. He doesn't apologize for who he is. He gets out of the car, you know, with a videographer looking like come out of like, a, he deserves to be on a Harley in the seventies 
And I'm thinking, who is this guy? And but we just hit it off. I just I love the dude to death. So he is he is that was kind of it when I first met him. He came on our podcast and I wasn't impressed. And then uh I don't know, it was some other guy told me about him, but he's hilarious. I've I've uh the bet we have is that he I'm having Corey Belmore, who is uh the world record holder of the beer mile. Uh okay. the guy runs the beer mile in four twenty four. Okay. Four twenty four. Four beers. I can't drink four beers in that time, but yeah. I can't either. I really don't think I could chug four beers in four twenty. I could maybe, maybe. Four twenty four. Hunter. I know Hunter did it. The first time he tried, I know he did it in eight and a half minutes. I know he did. He's telling me he can crush six minutes. I go, you're not going to break six minutes. He's like, if I do six minutes, you give me four ads on the show. Like, you got it. You got four ads for your training program. So I am, I am, I cannot wait to watch him try to do this because yeah, you better. He better film it. I mean, look, if CrossFit Games is going to give Adam Klink the whole uh, marketing for the 500-pound back squat and five-minute mile, which is impressive, yeah. then I definitely want to see Hunter McIntyre do sub six with a beer mile because he's also a CrossFit Games athlete. That would be very entertaining <laughs> to watch. He, he is a CrossFit Games athlete with an asterisk. <laughs> hey, he's been in the CrossFit Games. I mean – you want you might want to say with an asterisk. Well, then you better give it to every other national champ that showed up, or That's any true. other CrossFit Games athlete that couldn't make it past the first event, which Hunter That's, did. That's true. So I mean, That's true. You know, I mean, I, I you were pushing for him. You were you were very supportive of him, and uh, you know, I I I pushed as hard as I could to get him in there, and uh, and I really to this day think that if he had was a little smarter on how he. Yep. He did that round. He would have gone through the next round too with the ruck. And, you know, and then he would have been sitting a lot high. Like we all, you know, estimated that he was 25th to 30. And that's, yeah. I mean, to go into the CrossFit Games and be top 30 in the world, that's really, really impressive. Yeah. We, I was I was really disappointed. He he took that handstand push-up block uh, a little bit not as patient as he should have been. Because I was excited to see how far I could go. I, I like everyone in my sport, but I, I like seeing trash talking in my sport, oh, too. It's, it's amazing. And I love Hunter McIntyre, and I love Britt Bukowski, and I know they had talked some trash to each other. Yeah. So I just wanted him to be around Britt Bukowski. I didn't know how far Britt was going to make it or, you know, how far I was going to make it. But I just thought to myself, man, that would be some great content if Hunter beat Britt out. I knew it wasn't going to happen, but yeah, I thought the yeah. closer he can get – maybe the more people would be like, you know what? He actually didn't do too bad, but yeah, he can't. Well, it's like him. everybody knew McGregor was going to get beat by Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. Everyone knew it was going to happen. It, it just, and there were these people, going, no, maybe. And it's like, you're out of your mind. That's what Hunter was. He was McGregor fighting Mayweather. And, and that was a fun fight to watch. I mean, I got to be honest, other than you and maybe like three other guys, Crossfitters are some, I do this show every week, are some of the boringest motherfuckers oh, yeah. I have ever met in my life. And there's a reason for that. People that go to the gym usually are like attracted to the gym because it's like a way that they can get away from being social and they <laughs> work out and they work on their body. And then they go to like a nightclub where they see some other chick with like a really hot body and they just shake their heads and go, mm, 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 uh, uh, and then they reproduce. And like, so Hunter brought some energy to this thing. And I know there were like a lot of people on the side of like, hey, this is great. It's great for the sport. It brings this. And then there were a lot of people like, this is the worst thing ever. And I was like, you have no idea. Like, why is wrestling, you know, the, the number one form of entertainment in America? And it's fake. It's all fake. And people love it because it's entertaining. And he was just bringing entertainment to it. So um but i'm hoping i'm hoping some more entertainment comes in i'm thinking without glassman there well glassman was pretty entertaining but in his own right yeah oh my god and i, I are we now allowed to talk i mean you're not probably because everybody's like still scared but i even me i was like afraid sometimes like, can we talk about how much that guy used to booze now that he's gone <laughs> yeah he wasn't i think from my perspective a company uh, needs leadership that reflects the company. Like a company can only do as well as the, like the ideals and values of a company 
role down from a leader. So you need a leader to control a company. And if a leader gets away with certain things, does certain things that you and I may or may not agree with, the company will reflect it. And in that case, this is Jacob's very generalized statement. In that case, that's what CrossFit did. And it wasn't in a good, it wasn't in a good fashion. And I think, I think, um, you know, I think Greg did an awesome job. Without Greg, yeah. we wouldn't have CrossFit. No, no, like, no, no, no. The guy had an incredible yeah. theory and crea- yes. that happens a lot of the times. Like people come up with a great idea, then they hire a CEO to run their company. And mm. I think, uh, you know, this owner was just a little like, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm torn on if he did anything that wrong or, you know, like, I don't think he's a racist guy by any means at all. I think he's done some amazing stuff. And, um, but I think he didn't handle himself professionally. And this new guy, not only that, but the new guy, he, he walks the walk. Like, yeah, he's, he's got a athlete. friend. He's got a friend time of like 240 or something. Yeah, he competed as an athlete. So from my perspective, it's nice to see someone that, yeah, you know, I would like someone to have done CrossFit to buy the company, but to have someone that competes in that can relate with me is even better. Yeah. Is everybody running back to it now? Well, I'm sure they are. I never ran from it. You, um, you were all, you, you, you're an affiliate owner, aren't you? I am not. I, I, thought, I will not own affiliate. Yeah. Wait, but your sister, I worked out with your sister one time at a gym Ooh. in Kansas City, and she beat but, the shit out of me. <laughs> I mean, Runs the family, I guess, eh? <laughs> no, but I mean, it was like, I think she was trying, I think I came in probably like, yeah, I'm a crossfitter from California, and she was like, okay, uh, good luck. And then she just- She's just, from California, too. She just destroyed me. Just, I mean, yeah. it was awful. So she was a head coach at CrossFit Overland Park in Kansas City. Yeah, um, that's where I was. I, have never and probably will never own a CrossFit gym. Um, mm-hmm. What I liken it to is it takes a special person to run a CrossFit gym. You have to be very emotionally connected to people, want to see people succeed, but also have to put up with a lot of stuff that I personally on a day-to-day basis don't have patience for. I know what I'm not capable of. And, you know, sometimes putting up with you know, lack of better terms, sometimes people's crap is not something that I know I'll be good at and be very patient at. And so I'm not going to ever probably own a CrossFit gym. So where'd you make your money before CrossFit? I was, um, I graduated with a degree in mathematics, uh, bachelor's, uh, worked for the army up in Fort Leavenworth for a while. Um, as a DOD civilian, uh, then left that job after I got married and worked as a project manager for a web development company. Uh, I worked, um, remote. It was located in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I still lived here in Kansas. Kansas City, Kansas. And so did that job for about three years as a project manager, loved it, learned a lot. Um, then last June, I decided that, you know what, you got you to take your shots. I decided, you know what, I think I can make a good go at this, being an entrepreneur and owning things. And I was tired of working. I had a great, I had a great boss, don't get me wrong, but I was tired of making money for someone else and not making a name for myself. I decided I want to own something. I want to slate my name and I know I can do it. And that's so, what we're doing now. So what is it now? Yeah, you ready for this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to my life. This is about to really either really impress you or really be like, how do you have this much time in a day? I can't wait to hear this. All right. So currently right now, uh, I uh, have a programming company, Grit, um, which is my personal programming that I sell online and also um, and also uh, have pulled in other subject matter expert coaches to present programming on my platform, essentially in a profit sharing concept, right? So I liken it to brute strength is a great example of that. They do a great job. And I was a part of brute strength for a long time, loved them, love what they do and decided that that's a great business model to follow. And so that's what I'm essentially creating is pulling in subject matter experts to present programming online that are underneath my name, underneath my company. Okay. Um, that's CrossFit programming online. Very simple. Uh, the next step is a nutrition company. So I part own a nutrition company that is solely based online. It was actually based in our gym. We had a nutrition company with a couple different people uh, selling programming and helping people with macros. And it's like day-to-day conversations. Instead of like, hey, Eddie, uh, this is what you should be eating. Good luck. It's a relational company where we call you every day, every week, whatever you need to make sure you're fitting what you need. And so I decided... It was doing really well inside the gym. I decided, you know what? You need someone to help you push it out to the masses. And so I decided to buy into the company and I own, uh, part own that. Um, and then I'm in the process. I actually, in the process of owning, 
I actually own two other apps in development and the third one upcoming. So it's five separate things. And of those apps, see which ones can I, can I talk about? Because we're still in like NDAs. Uh, one of them I co-own with Scott Panchik. Okay. Um, that, yeah, so that was going to be really big. It's going to be really great uh, for the functional fitness space in terms of COVID and being staying at home and mm -hmm. connecting communities across the world and coaches. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited about that one. It's going to be like an on-demand, live, and pre-recorded kind of concept app. So that's going to be really cool. And then uh, a separate app we're going to be starting pretty soon is – doesn't have anything to do with, with CrossFit and fitness. So do you so do, totally do you do the programming yourself? Do you do you build the apps or do you have, do you outsource all that? Yeah, but I uh, I usually pull in a developer to help out. So in terms of Scott Panchik and I working together, uh, we are part owners with a guy who does development. So I don't have to do it myself. Right. When I worked for Asponte as a project manager, um, I led a team of developers, but did not develop myself. Right. So I can talk the talk, but I cannot actually develop myself. Right. Um, and so that, or I hire out app companies or the other part owner usually is a developer. Usually. What was your job at the department of defense? I was a mathematics technician. Um, okay. essentially what it was is we use mathematics to help determine in and help make informed decisions for the army. So running models and Sims and mathematical simulations on what's the best solution for a problem you might have. So a problem could be, the Humvee sucks. How do we replace it? Okay, let's run some models and sims on what's the best replacement for uh, the Humvee. Stuff like that. Boring math stuff. You know, the what, stuff your, your teacher says, what am I ever going to use this for? And you're like, here's what you use it for, yeah. kids. Well, so. I, I've never had any, but I, when a math problem comes about, I'm like, I, um, hey, Siri, what is, <laughs> uh, you know, like I just, uh, Siri just turned on. Oh, absolutely. But it, I think from my perspective, like, and I've told other people, like, what you get your degree in in college, whether it's math, English, history, I don't think it really matters. I think what it teaches you is to learn who you are and how to think outside the box. And that's where'd what you, where'd you Where would you go to school? Really small school, uh, Central Methodist University. It's uh, smack dab right in the middle of, uh, of uh, uh, state of Kansas, state of Missouri, sorry, in Missouri. Oh, wow. So, so you went to a small school in another state, so you had to pay out-of-state fees. I lived in Missouri at that time. Oh, okay. I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. so it was, it, was, it was insane. What's better, Kansas City, Missouri, or Kansas City, Kansas? Ooh, Kansas City, Kansas. Really? This was where I live. I feel like it's, that's more of the farmlands, is it? Yeah, that's what I like. I like to escape. That's why I live in the middle of nowhere. I want to escape people, but be close enough to town. I know. We're, like, we're, the, we're the same way. We, we, you're, we, making we, a joke, you're making a joke about, oh, people go to the gym and they want to escape people. I'm yeah. thinking... I can be intro extroverted if I need to, but would I would like to be extroverted on a daily basis? Absolutely not. I got to save no. it for here and there. No, I'm this. I like as I was younger. The older I get, the more I'm like. We moved out to the country. We live up in the hills above Malibu, and now because of COVID, everybody's moving out here and coming out here. And I'm like, we got to go to Montana. We got to get out of here. We got to go maybe like northern Canada. We got to like find a place where no one is. I'm so sick of people. Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. And it's happening. Like our houses in our neighborhood, people put their house up for sale and it goes above asking the first day, the yeah. first day, everybody's houses are selling like crazy. Cause people are trying, people are just, there's a mass exodus out of the cities. And oh, yeah. I mean, we sold our house last weekend. Actually, we sold oh. our house on Facebook in three hours over asking price. <laughs> I was like, why am I going to pay a realtor six? For all the realtors listening, I love you guys, but I think your job is going to probably disappear pretty soon. But like, why do I need a realtor to sell my house? Why can't I take pictures myself, use social platforms? And I mean, yes, I understand they have a better network than me, but wasn't there's, there's a lot of, the, you know, the, I, my mom was a realtor and there's a lot of bullshit work you have to do that I wouldn't want to do if I sold Well, we house. hired someone to do paperwork. Absolutely. Right. I'm right. Okay. But in terms of the network and getting it out there and showing it. I don't need someone to show my house, but the paperwork, absolutely. I'm not well, it's, it's the same way in my business in like comedy. And uh, I had to have, when I first started in the business, the first thing I got was a manager. Manager takes 10 to 15%, depending on your, yeah. what you negotiate. Then I had to have an agent and you have, you can have different agents in different departments. Cause I write, I act, I do voiceover, I do commercials, I do TV, 
Uh, I do public appearance, which is stand-up comedy. We, I'd have all these different agents and they all take 15% or tell, I'm sorry, 10% of whatever they get me. So if my commercial agent gets me, they get 10%, but that's on top of the 10% my manager's taking. And then whenever a deal came through, like if a studio wanted to do a deal or something with me, there was a uh, lawyer involved. So 5% from the lawyer. So I was looking at 25% off the top of everything I was doing practically. 25%, yeah. like if it was a big enough deal, 25% would go away right off the top before taxes. And, you know, I'd get to write that off a little bit. That was, that was part of a write-off. I'd write off the 25% I paid. But still, it was just like, after, when the internet came out, I started going, why do I need these people? And I still keep a manager, but I got rid of practically everything else. And if the deal was big enough, I'd do a lawyer, but there was no need for an agent. I mean, it was, it was, and I, I, I remember it was funny. I, my agent and I uh, had a falling out and I left and uh, my work like tripled by doing it myself. And I, I mean, said, why you have I, to be able, like, so agent? I had a manager for a while for CrossFit and <clears throat> One of the biggest issues I have in my life that it, it could be an advantage or a disadvantage is I like to control situations myself. And sometimes it's a bad thing. I mean, a lot of times it's a bad thing. And I don't like to relinquish control to people. And when I had a manager, it was difficult for me, but I learned to do it. But then I found out when I decided to part ways with him that I could do it myself. Like now, can Matt Frazier do it himself? No, he's probably got so much. I'm not Matt Frazier. I don't have you know, random deals rolling in every single day. So that's different. And I get that. But like, you don't really sometimes need a manager. And I think what a lot of athletes forget when they have a manager is they forget how to talk to people. Yeah. yeah. Like, it, it, like it, I don't know how many times I've heard stories of, from talking to companies and brands of them being like, you're the first person who just called us on the phone and talked to us. And I'm like, well, yeah, I just want to have a conversation. I want you to, I want you to know that I'm real and I'm sitting here talking to you because half the time, you deal with athletes or influencers or people who don't know how to either talk on the phone, refuse to do it, and you don't even know who you're working with. So Yeah, um, Hunter and I were talking about this yesterday because he always is looking for a manager to do, you know, he's a real hustler. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and you have to be in this sport, yeah. especially, I was just talking to a buddy of mine who's a coach uh, the other day, he coaches one of the top females, and he was talking about how much money the women make compared to the men, how they all do better. And I'm like, yeah. that's, that's really weird to me. And he, and you know, the Hunter and I were talking about it yesterday and he's like, it's sex appeal. You know, the women are sexier. It sells more. Uh, women like exercise, you know, there's more women that are out there trying to lose weight, get in shape. So they're going to buy whatever they buy. And I'm like, no, 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 this doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me because men in every other sport, men lead the way. I mean, I, I almost every sport, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's, some that women are bigger in it, but um, I just can't understand why, you know, Matt Frazier makes all the money and then it trickles down to everyone else. It's, uh, you know, he is number one. He'll be number one for who knows how long. Sure. But, you know, and there was Froning who was probably making a fortune, uh, but it just seems like there's just more guys up there. And I, and I think it's a little bit of that lack of, uh, a little bit of that lack of personality. A little bit of like, you know, where Hunter makes good money because Hunter is so flamboyant yeah. and, and such an asshole that people go, he exactly. gets attention. Um, but for the rest of you guys, I mean, you, what were you? Number, you're number six in the world? You're right. six? six? Yeah, six. And James is five. James Newberg. Right. You're two guys that should just be raking in the dough. Raking. Noah, raking in the dough. I mean, the, the, it just it baffles me that you guys aren't all seven figure guys from CrossFit. It, it, well, it baffles so I'll address it a couple different ways. Number one, I actually, I understand why women make more in the sport. I would agree with you in that aspect. Um, usually the comparison, uh, who did I hear this from? I think Cole Sager and I were talking about it is usually when it comes to brands pulling in influencers or athletes like myself, Usually the women in our sport are four times as big. So a good comparison is Cole and I can be compared to like a Brooke Wells. Mm -hmm. She's got like a million followers. And so if you divide it by four, that's about where Cole Sager and I are at, which is a good representation. It makes sense. 
I actually, from my perspective, don't mind the fact that the women make more. I think it's actually a good thing because it's progressive in our sport to see, hey, the sport that I love and value actually loves and values women and the empowerment they bring to a lot of people, despite a lot of other different sports that don't value and don't pay them out as much. I mean, like, I think CrossFit was the one, one of the first sports that said, equal we're going to pay, yeah. Yeah, pay equal pay, which I love. It's and crazy. so if the women make more, it, I mean, I get it. Like, no, I, no, no, I'm not, no, no, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying like, oh, go man. And uh, no, what yeah, I'm saying sure. is I get it. women, uh, it's almost like I'd like to see men make as much as women. <laughs> sure. Yeah, <laughs> and, I get that. And Thank I you. don't, uh, and I, looking at the psychology of people, um, why it is, and, and, you know, I get, I get it's that sex appeal and that, that, that Instagram stuff, but I, I also, I am a, I'm a big disbeliever in Instagram and Facebook and all the followers because I know from my business how corrupt that business is. Sure. And how much people buy followers, people will leverage and spend as much money as they can to get as many followers as they can. And there's this herd mentality that all of a sudden when somebody has followers, everyone else starts following oh, yep. and they build an entire following based on like false pretenses and then they're raking in the dough. And it, it happened in comedy. It was pretty bad for a while because there were guys doing that. They were just building these huge followings online and then the comedy clubs would book them. And that's where the money was coming. And they were working all over the country because they, it looked like, you know, on the internet that they had a million followers. Well, then they would do a show and only 50 people would show up. And it's like, yeah. well, what happened to your million people? Where are they? Why aren't they coming to see you? And even the ones that were entertaining on online, that doesn't naturally translate to stand up. That's like saying, oh, cause you're, cause you play a flute in your underwear on Instagram doesn't mean that you can go play with the New York Symphony. You know, you have to have, like stand up was like this different skill. So just because that whole influencer idea, that just because someone has a million Instagram followers and is a CrossFitter, doesn't mean that they're that great at their sport. You know, there's, there's a couple out there, I don't, I don't wanna say their names, but you know. Absolutely, but I think that's why companies have been rotating to look at engagement, right? And I, and I guarantee what your comeback's gonna be is, well, you can buy engagement. And I yeah. totally get that, you totally could. Um, yeah, no, you're right. I think when it comes down to it, companies and brands need to refocus on how they pick people they wanna work with. And those, that picking needs to be based upon, you know, does Jacob Hetner or does Cole Sager or does whoever, Noah Olson, do their values fit the company? Do they have a personality that fits? I mean, sometimes companies don't care about that. And that's fine. Depends on what company you're working with. But I think there's going to be, you know, you're correct. There should be more than just numbers based upon numbers. It should be more yeah. than just what is the number in front of the K or the M on your Instagram, say. And what is the more than engagement? I totally well, agree. Well, I just, I also think it's an undervalued sport. I, I think if you look at athletes and other sports and the amount of endorsements they're getting, and then you look at, like, the amount of followers you guys have are up at professional athletes of like sure. more, more yeah. like, like take any baseball player on a baseball team. You know, the top three players will probably have more numbers than you guys. But after that, no, you know, like, and, and so, you know, the amount of their contracts and I, I guess you can say their contracts are coming out of somebody's I'm going to get, killed for this people are going to write to me and be like you're an idiot their money's coming from ticket sales and the television sponsorship of the tv deals of those games so but there's still the endorsements i guess you can say because of the tv time they're getting of the endorsements but i don't know i just feel I like they're still an I'm undervalue totally, sure i i get that but i think because i love playing devil's advocate <laughs> I think from an athlete perspective, <clears throat> what I tell a lot of younger athletes or current athletes is I respect Matt Frazier, not because in Britt Fikowski, not because Matt Frazier and Britt Fikowski win. I respect them because they're wise and they're wise because of how they make money, because they know that Britt Fikowski or Jacob Hepner or Noah Olson is one broken leg away from never competing again. Sure. Now, Matt might be a bad example because if he breaks his leg, he's set up for success the rest of his life. 
But what I think a lot of athletes need to understand is that if you're living off of what you make as winnings, if you're only making money because of what you make at the games or what you make in Dubai or what you make from the open or whatever the heck it is, you're an idiot. You need to be able to take your platform, the stage you've been giving, and then turn that into something that can substantially sustain you after you're done competing. Sure. And a lot sure. of athletes will, will, will go through their whole CrossFit career, won't do that, will leave the sport, and then realize, oh, well, now I've got to – now I got to figure this out. And it, that, ha that happens in every sport. Yeah. Though. And it doesn't, I'm not saying this to be like, well, you're an idiot. Sometimes it makes me feel sad for them. Like, I really wish you would have done something else. And oh, really I, I, I follow pro surfing a lot. And you see the pro surfers, uh, like the majority of them when it's over. And you're like, like six years later, they're working in a surf shop. And you're like, you're really, you were like a celebrity. And now you're, and then you see a couple other guys who, you know, they, they do well while they're in it, you know, and they, they figure out and they invest in something, they create a company sure. and they're entrepreneurial. And, and that's, I think it just takes the type of person because some people can't like, they just want to focus on their sport and they want to win and they're in the now. And they're like, this is all I want to do. And I just want to focus and do this. And then there's other people who also fail at business. You know, they try and try and try and it's just not their thing. Like just because they're great at sports doesn't mean they're great at business and they fail a lot. Um, True. You know, and, that, and that's what I'd say, pull in a manager or an agent right. and then right. figure something out. How can, you know, I'm Brent's a bad example because he has the professor project. He's, he does it. He's really smart at what he does. But like Brent would be an example of maybe Brent's not good at owning a business, which he's not. But if he was, hey, I need to pull in a manager. Let's figure out when I'm done, how can I capitalize on my time and crossbow how are you training still with this schedule with all these different things you're working on yeah uh i mean i train as normal um i have what does that I've take learned. priority does training take yeah. priority well yeah because it's who i am right now yeah. uh takes priority right now um it will of course at some point in my life maybe the next you know year or so start to rotate to look a little bit different to how old to focus are you now on, uh 30 okay yeah so uh it takes priority Absolutely. Um, but the beauty of what I've done and what I've learned is I've learned that I can't do everything. I know what my time's worth and I delegate and have a really good team behind me. So I have a really great team in every company I run that does a good job and is invested in the company because they want to see it succeed because it's not, if it doesn't succeed, it's not just my paycheck, it's everyone's paycheck. Um, so I have surrounded myself with some really successful, very intelligent people that love doing their jobs. Um, and so being able to delegate to them and trust them has been huge for me because, you know, I can't sit on the day-to-day -day activities of some of these companies because I don't have time for it. So what do you think the window is of a, of a CrossFit Games athlete? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, like, I'm not saying that obviously there's going to be outliers and people be sure. able to do it till they're, I don't know how Sam old. Breaks. I, I, I feel like, yeah, Bill Grundler could probably still. Like, yeah. <laughs> Bill Grundler's like... 86 and he could probably still still he, he just missed the cut uh but what do you think it realist oh. you good uh-oh hold on issue big issue hold on Okay, so I was saying Bill Grundler or someone like that. No, not Bill because he's you know been out a while. But you know, how old's Matt right now? He's my age. We're both thirty. Okay, so you guys could probably go a number of years. But what do you think is the is the age where it just starts to? <clears throat> what do you think you got left in the tank? I think it comes down to person. I mean, yeah, I think it comes down to person to person. I said I think you're asking a really generalized question, like. It's going to come down to, you know, really, what do you want to do? Like, personally, I don't really want to compete as a master's. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I think 32, 33, I'm done. Um, and not because, you know, I'm done competing. Now, what I've told a lot of people is I would love to announce. I would love to commentate. I would love to do any of these things because, and give back to the sport because the sport has given me everything. 
Um, but I think it's going to come down to person to person. Like Noah, for instance, is a great example. I know, I know Noah wants to compete for as long as he can. He, mm-hmm. he, Noah is the kind of person that just absolutely loves it. Like he loves the camaraderie, the community. I'm not saying I don't love it, but I think from his perspective that that competing is really who Noah is. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just not who I am as much as Noah is. And sure. so it's just a difference of athlete to athlete. But I think Noah will probably compete as long as, as, long as his fiance will let him do yeah, it. Yeah, but he says it now, but he's still, he's still young. And that's, uh, you know, you, you say that when you're young and then your perspective changes. I said I'd never get married. I said I'd never have kids. That all changed. Um, yeah. Uh, but, like, do you feel differently, like, at 30? I mean, I know how old I am. I, I didn't start CrossFit until I was in my late 30s. And I've been doing it, like, 10 years, 12 years, whatever. Um, and it's, I, like, I just look back at some of my times or some of my, and I'm like, ugh, ugh, like, really like this age has really taken its toll it like pisses me off because i i always look at people hey i pr'd and i'm blah 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 or i'm this or i'm that and it's like yeah that's great but just overall generally speaking i've seen a decline and it pisses me off it might be because i have just extra shit in my life or whatever it is but you know soreness and everything at 30 is there any drop off at all that you felt yeah, I think there's going to be a drop in terms of recovery, and you, you can't do things like you did when you were 23 when you started, or 24 whenever I started. Like, you have to be uh, a little smarter in the way you warm up, a little smarter in the way that you're like, okay, I can't do a thousand wall balls today because I know my knees are going to blow sky high. Like, there's obviously there, there's going to be a degradation, and it's going to continue that way for sure. And it's just going to, I'm just going to hope, in fact, that as my, you know, but as I get a little bit older, maybe I get wiser in how I approach the situation, whether that is nutrition or whether that is recovery. You just hope that those two are correlated. Yeah. Well, um, you know, because you also, you're not, like, if you looked at you standing beside uh, some of these guys, how tall are you? You're, you, you've got- Five, seven and a half. Yeah. Five, seven. So you're, you're right almost in that perfect range. Mm-hmm. Um, but- but you also, you're not like, like you and James Newberry, I look at you both and you're not stocky and gigantic like some of these guys and you don't have that, but you're able to move the weight just as well as them. And I'm like, well, where does that come from? I don't know what you mean by one of those guys. I mean, I think the averages were 5'7", 190. Hey, would you say that what it is? It's 5'7", 190 to 195. And I think on average- Are you 190? I'm 195. Really? 190, 195. So I think you on don't... average, I am average in this point. Okay, so I would say you don't carry the weight like that. Like, I would never look. on my butt. I... Oh, it is? <laughs> I... See, I would, I would not look at you like you're one of those big. Like, if you look at Hunter right now, he looks so bulky, it's scary. He's just. Well, oh, he's also six foot. But he's become. Four, whatever he is. But he's become bulky. Like, sure. uh, like you still look lean. And, uh, and it, I don't, same with James. I've all, I always look at James. I'm 170, I'm 5'10", 170. And I always, when I'm like standing next to James, I don't feel like I'm standing next to a monster where some of these guys, you just feel like they're a monster. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the difference in the sport, right? If you, if all you wanted me to do was lift, then I'd be bulky. But if all you, if you all you want me to do is swim and run, I'd be skinny. But because it's a, mix of both of those things i'm going to be a mix of both of those things and then of course you'll see guys that'll that'll toe the line in certain directions more than others i mean like um i don't know him personally um the super nice guy uh that i'm looking forward to competing with in a couple of weeks but the guy who won the norwegian crossfit sanctionals is actually his i think his instagram handle is crossfit four the dude is oh, massive i've seen him he's massive he's massive bro massive massive scary like, scary oh, dude. When, like, I, when i saw they i think they showed on morning chalk up uh, him doing some snatch or something where he something had, like, stupid but it was like all tens loaded up too it was like a snatch and it was 305 or something and he had like it was all tens because i was like is this guy about to lift like 600 pat what am i about to watch and then i looked down at the the number and i went oh i mean that's impressive but it's not I guess it's just, you know, he just kept loading, uploading, uploading. But then I looked at him and they're like, you know, top CrossFit. Blah, blah. And I'm like, how is this guy? You know, he looks like Jimmy Foo or whatever. Jimmy, J- you know, the dude that like kicks flamingos. 
Yeah, yeah. He looks like yeah. him. I mean, but, but that's the difference is like he's – there are going to be people who tow the line in different directions, and that's just, you know, they'll get to the sport. And I'm sure he's a great runner, but he'll get if – he, if he makes it to top five or when we have the games in 2021, you know, like there will be some things he won't be good at. Like I can't outsnatch him. There's going right. to be a huge difference. Right, so. right, right. What is your snatch? Uh, low. What is it? Come on. I think my all-time max is 270. And, but I, was, I think I weighed 205 at the time. I, was, I decided to eat so much cheesecake and food and just get over 200 pounds. And then I had to lose it for the Open. So. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, you say that and act like, it, like you got to bulk up and be strong. But whenever you look at those Olympic guys, the, like, real Olympic lifters, like the, the ones that go to the Olympics, sometimes they're so, like, small yeah. – and they just have such efficient movement. I watched um, a video of uh, Chris Spieler power snatching the other day, just doing like reps. And the efficiency in his movement, it was flawless. It was like there wasn't the bar, the, the path the bar was moving. I was like, oh, my God. Like, this guy should just teach a clinic in this. I mean, it's, it's amazing how well he was doing it. And, I mean, because he has to. The sure. size he is, if he wants to move that weight, he has to. So, you know, I think a lot of guys have, have proved that kind of thing wrong with the – I mean, sure, it's going to help if you're a giant. But but uh, I don't know. So so why did you move? Did you sell that farm? Yes, yeah, so we had 10 acres of land. Uh, we sold it, um, and we bought 50 acres down the road. Oh, okay. Uh, that's, yeah, we, so we bought some acres down the road. Um, and, uh, we've got a house on it that we're going to renovate. Um, and in the process of renovating it, we're also going to build, um, a barn, a much larger barn gym for me. Um, and then also the house I'm going to die in because my wife's designing, it's like humongous. So I'm never moving and building ever again. You say so, that. Yeah. My in-laws. No, no, no. This is, the, I, there's a, there's going to be a room in there. I'm going to pick my tree out where they're burying me under when I'm dead. And that's it. <laughs> I'm never moving. That's it. <laughs> Like, it's ridiculous. You know, you, know so. you can do that. I hate to be morbid and I hate to talk about death because it's like the thing I hate the most. Uh, who cares? Uh, but they can, they can, uh, that's like a burial thing now where they put you in whatever the, the thing, the, the bulb of the roots of the tree, they put your ashes in there and they bury it and, or they, 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 you know, put it in the ground and let it grow. And then you're that tree. You're part of yeah. that tree. So people can I don't walk really by. care about that. You can go throw me out in the dirt. I mean, I'm yeah. dead. Who cares? I'm, I'm, like, I'm one of them. I like the surfer thing. It's literally like we paddle out in the ocean and you just throw the ashes in the water. Yeah, and like, there you go. Later, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Cemeteries creep me the fuck out. I hate them. I hate driving by them. I was in Telluride recently and we were driving by and there's the most beautiful houses in Telluride. And we see this one house and I go, oh my God, that house is a mate. And then I'm like, ew, ew, its backyard is a cemetery. That'd and be I'm so like, bad. Like, how could you live there and just like wake up and look out and just be like, death? <laughs> yeah. The only way that. I find it acceptable is if they're like, oh, you know who lives there is like George Romero or some famous like horror films, you know, guy. Because who else would, how could, people would be like, oh, I live near a cemetery, didn't bother me at all. I lived near where they made Dawn of the Dead, when my first house that I lived in as a kid, they made that horror film, I think it's Dawn of the Dead the VA hospital in Pittsburgh is mm -hmm. where it like happened. That was my backyard. I would look through the fence and I'd see it. And when I saw the movie, I was like, we got to move. We're like, let's go. I can't live here anymore. If you want me to have nightmares every night, pack up, let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> um, I had, uh, I, I was, I, I wanted to ask you about the military though. How come you would work department of defense, but you had no interest ever being military. You look like you're in it right now. Yeah, I've always said this haircut okay, since I was young. Um, I wish I hate you. I wish I hate you for because you have the best hairline, and <laughs> yeah. you shave it off. If I, uh, my, my God, I would look like the other part of Hall and Oates. <laughs> it's it's the, the 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 joke is like the guys who care about their hair lose it, and the guys who could care less about their hair always keep it. Like a pro I would love if my hair never grew and I could go bald. It'd be freaking save me so much time, but I can't. I know, but um. Uh, no, I was never in the military. Uh, it wasn't that I didn't want to join the military. It was the fact that I worked as a DOD civilian for them. So I was recruited and hired to work as a civilian for the Department of Defense for the Army. 
So it wasn't that I didn't have the option. It was just the job requirement was as a civilian. Yeah. That's, that's just a weird thing to go in, like work for the military and not be the contractor part. work. There's a lot of people that work. Uh, for yeah, the I guess you're right. Yeah. 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 A lot of people work for the department of defense that aren't, that aren't uh, military. Yeah. So, I mean, I worked alongside a lot of people. So the, the people that make all the money, <laughs> the real money. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. I remember cause I was, uh, I used to work in Dubai a lot doing mm -hmm. comedy and I would run into a lot of contractors that were going over there to work that were former military. And I was like, what are you in there? Like, now, now I'm making the money, you know, and private sector, private sector is lucrative. I mean, that can be said about any, I mean, that's like a high risk, high reward, right? It's what we're talking about, like being, working for someone you're capped, but if you can do your own thing and be your own boss, sky's the limit, but you got to be able to be like, I could lose it all. I could gain it all. It's one of the two. Right. So let's get into it. What about this year's games? How, how do you feel about it? Um, you know, from my perspective, if we even take this pandemic, this thing out of it, right? Uh, you take the pandemic out of it. At some point, you need to ask yourself, is it worth it? Right. And not from a pandemic perspective, but from the perspective of is the experience going to be the same? Look, I get why they're trying to have the games. They want to have the games. Personally, I think they want to have the games because they want to get paid by Reebok contractually. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot so, of people are saying that. Yeah. So uh, I get that. You want to get paid your money. It's your last year. They may never come back. Who knows? But you have to ask yourself, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the experience going to be the same? You know, now you're only going with five males and five females. And so last year there was a lot of uh, naysayers concerning, okay, did we actually find the fittest? Like last year, I think they found the fittest on earth person. But the mm -hmm. argument was, I don't think anyone argued that. The argument was, did they find, was the order of operations, was the order of the fittest people laid out, was that the actual order? Was the top 10 actually the top 10 because of cuts, okay? So if you're gonna make that argument about last year, then this year has gotta be completely worse. Um, because, you know, now we're gonna do, and look, they're gonna do something that's great. I'm not putting that down. I think they, they probably need to do something. Experience won't be the same. And I think sometimes you need to ask yourself, is it worth it? Maybe we should just pack up the bags and say, you know what? We'll see you in 2021. Um, but I do honestly love the opportunity to compete and to do this online games and then hopefully qualify to go to Aromas to be top five, if that even happens. You know, I think, you know, it comes down to Monterey County. In Monterey County. They could just say, nah, groups over 25 are canceled and then they're done. They yeah. can't do nothing. Yeah, so, it's, it's, I mean, it's funny, five, 10, 15, I feel like the numbers are so random that it's like, well, sure, you're gonna limit, you're, you're, you know, you're the mathematics guy. Sure, you're gonna limit it by the less people, but you're still, there's exposure no matter what. As Soon as you're mixing, there's exposure. And five, yeah, five is way better than 500 people there. Uh, oh. But if you're, if you're doing testing, if you're, living in kind of a bubble for that time period, I don't see why it only has to be five. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. You can do, well, the tests are getting so accurate and, excuse me, and so quick that they would be able to bring in enough people, you know, bring in 20 or 40 or whatever it is, do the testing, live in kind of a bubble for those four or five days that the safety would be there. And I guess it's that, well, then we'd have to bring in judges. And then we'd have to bring in, exactly. you know, there'd be no media and or we'd need more media and we'd need this. Well, there might be that. media, but the, my, the fact of the matter is when we had the previous option, they were going to take 30 of us, their Romas, they sent out the rules for what it was going to look like. And they were going to, I could bring one person with me. We shared a room. We could never leave the hotel room. They chose our hotel room and they chose the hotel. We got given a room. We couldn't leave the hotel room unless we walked to the bus and went straight to the ranch. Okay. So people had to bring us food somehow. I have no idea how. And my thought was, okay, whether you think this pandemic is as deadly as it seems or is not deadly as it seems, you either need to go all in and double down on efforts or don't do it at all. If you do it halfway, it doesn't do you any good to do stuff halfway. So either you make the athletes and that person who comes with them sit in a room and don't talk to anybody, 
but then you better also be doing it with all your judges, volunteers, media, and everybody else doing it. And I don't think that was going to happen. Yeah, which so is weird. Like, okay. Which is weird. Yeah. You're exposing the athletes then to it. Like the athletes are making are the ones making all the sacrifice, and yet they're the ones getting exposed to it. So that's not fair at all. Um, I see that happen in a lot of situations where people are like, oh, we're doing this or we're doing this. I'm like, nobody's doing this right. I mean, the White House is probably the only place where they are so, and still it sneaks in there. You know, you look at New Zealand, New Zealand shut down completely and they just had four cases. They had to shut down the whole country because four people got it uh, yeah. two days ago. And uh, do, you so think the, do you think the economic, the economics in New Zealand are worse shutting down a country with four people. You want, you want to, do you want to like change this podcast into like, let's talk about well, actual well, world I'll issues. I'll tell you this. In New Zealand, most of their income comes from tourism. Tourism. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. So they and already, so, you're saying they already shut down their economy then pretty much. Yeah. Their economy shut down completely. I mean, I, I, I say to people who say they don't want to wear masks, they go, Oh, I don't want to wear masks, blah, blah, blah. You're infringing on my freedom. I'm like, yeah, but your freedoms, infringing on my freedom because if you would wear the mask and we could shut this down then i could get back to my normal life but you're not letting me get back to my normal life because you won't wear a mask so so when people go it's my freedom and i go yeah, yeah. not if it's infringing on my freedom <laughs> so so i i don't believe that argument either because masks do work scientifically there's a reason doctors and nurses wear them all the time. My buddy's a cardiologist. I just talked to him. But, the other but I'm day. not arguing about the usability of mass. I'm, I'm arguing the economic, the, epino the, the, the economics in it. Like, is it worth it? I, I don't know. That's hard. That would take, yeah, you know, lots of, lots of, I, I don't have the ability to do that, to sit down. I, I, I failed microeconomics in college. I wouldn't. I never took to economics, sit. so I can't even pronounce it. So and, I, I'm <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, I was talking yesterday to a buddy of ours all about modern monetary policy and about printing money and how long we can just continue to print money. And he's like, forever. And I was like, what do you mean forever? And he's like, inflation will go up, but they adjust the inflationary measures and make it look something else. And people, because, you know, forever they've been like, there's no inflation. Bullshit. There's, there's been inflation. There's been inflation at like, don't tell me there's not inflation. I know how much I paid for something and now how much I pay for something. And it, and it's, it's gone up in pricing. So, uh, the, I don't know about the economics of it, and I don't know how far we are off getting a vaccine and if that will be the solution to it. You know, I read a lot about the, the Spanish flu of 1918 and how does it eventually die out? Does it just die? It, I mean, or it does it. Yeah, it's. Do we, do we all just get it and then it's kind of like the measles? Like, okay, well, now we've all had it. Or you're going to get it at one time in your life and you either live or you die. Like Funny, oh, funny oh. thing about the measles is I have the measles vaccine as a kid. When we had our newest Cheater. baby, when we had our newest baby, they sent me to my, my, my kid's doctor said, go get, uh, go get tested to see if your measles is working. Cause there'd been a measles epidemic in, in California. She goes, go check and see if your measles vaccine's working. And I went, huh? She's like, yeah, there's a test. Go, I'll give you the prescription, whatever. So I go to Quest, I get blood drawn. And they're like, yeah, yours doesn't work. And I was like, what? They're like, yeah, your, your, your measles vaccine that you got years ago, it ran out. It's just not working. And I'm like, so there's people running around all over the place that are my age that think they're vaccinated and they're not. Mm. So, I, would say I mean, how good are we at vaccinating? Like, Everybody keeps going, the vaccine, the vaccine. Nobody's going to get that shit. Are you going to run in and go, go ahead, yeah, put some protein in me that is a, is a dead virus or whatever it is. And I mean, that we have no, we don't know how this reacts or how long. And sure, it's the oh. FDA approved. But how many commercials have you seen with lawyers that are like, hey, did you take Retin-A when you were yeah. well? You want to make some money? It was FDA approved, but we can get you yeah. dollars. How deadly do you think this disease is? Like if 150,000 people have died with COVID-19 in the United States, how many do you think actually died of COVID? And how many do you think actually just died of heart disease and happened to have COVID? Mm. It's, hard to, say, media, in, it's in, hard to in, say because people die of heart disease that have cancer. 
You know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Like Absolutely. their body's full of cancer and they'll go, oh, he died of a heart attack. Uh, yeah. I think I don't believe that conspiracy that doctors and everything are writing COVID on everything to get more money. I, I just don't believe that. My, but what I was going to go back to, my friend's a cardiologist. I just said to him, he was in his office wearing his mask. And I was like, so you haven't gotten it yet. Because I'm like, he said, I got 10 patients right now that have it in my hospital. And I said, you haven't gotten it yet. And he's like, no, nobody's gotten it. Like no doctors, no nurses. No, and I'm like, why not? And he said this. I mean, this is just might be hearsay. He goes, uh, it's like, you got to be around it for like 15 minutes with a mask off. You got to really like immerse your, like, if your family member has it, you're sleeping in the same bed. I had a buddy, Johnny Mosley, uh, the skier. His kid got it. He slept in the same bed with the kid for a while and didn't get it. You know, like mm -hmm. his, his kid was sick. And um, it's, it's uh, I don't know how these viruses, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody knows. The neurovirus is like one of the most contagious, infective things in the world. And this summer or this winter, Christmas, my little, like, he wasn't even, he was like six months old. My kid got it. And we just saw him puke and we're like, whoa, 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 that's weird. And then he puked again, he got diarrhea and we're like, oh no. And the next thing you know, my entire family started shitting and puking. Like yeah. everyone, my dad, my sister, her kids, their kid, it spread. They were calling my kid, his name's Cruz. They were calling him cruise ship because he like infected everybody. And patient zero. That's, that's his nickname in the family. That's what they call yeah. him. They, to this day, they call him patient zero. Patient zero, yeah. I never got it. Mm. I, my daughter was puking out of the bed. I was sleeping in bed with her, holding her hair while she was puking. And I didn't get it. So not saying like I have this amazing immune system. I've gotten sick a million times in my life. I just think like so much of this shit we don't know. And yeah. It's almost getting yeah. to the point. It's almost as much as I want to stay safe and want everyone to stay safe. It's almost like sure. throw your fucking hands in the air and go. I, yeah, it's hard when there's so many dissenting opinions. I don't care. You know, like my thought is like, I'm from Kansas. I'm of course going to be probably fairly conservative. And let's just assume that you're from California you might be fairly liberal. And that's fine. But it's, it's hard for me to make informed decisions on things when there's so much different information out there, you know, like, but okay. Even, I mean, even misinformation coming from the sources everywhere from, and then, so I want people, people that are listening, I don't want to ever make it sound like, you know, like, Oh, cause I'm right wing. I'm always going to be right. Or if you're left, you're wrong. No, I don't care where it's from. It comes from everybody all over. And I don't well, know who to believe. Well, you, yeah. Cause you had the CDC saying, do this, don't do this. No, do this. No, don't do this. <laughs> the, the oh, we learned CDC. This. Yeah, yesterday, a new report coming out saying six feet's not enough. And it's like, you know, UV rays kill it. UV rays don't kill it. Yeah. It just, it's really sad. I mean, I think um, 2020, I think when 2020 is over, we'll learn a lot of things about ourselves. But I just see a lot of perpetrating fear. There's a lot of fear out there sure. right now. And, and all over the place. And whether that's from COVID-19 or, or whatever the case may be. And it's just, I wish for once we could all just band together and say, this is what's going to happen. This is what we need to do. We don't have that. And, and like we talked about in the first beginning of the call, you know, um, we need leadership that gives us a good way forward. Well, I, leadership I rolls down. I hope this. I hope that after the election's over, and, I, and it doesn't make it right, but I hope this is the truth so that we can get this behind us. I hope that this has been completely politicized and that it will Me die too. after the election and that America, you know, because people realize. go, well, it's, if it's politicized, what's happening in Europe and what's happening in, sure. in China? And what's, I'm hoping America led that media charge and then all the media around the world kind of followed. And when America stops, the rest of the world will stop. And then we'll realize, oh, it's not what we thought it was. No. Yeah. And I hope it does go away. I don't, I don't know if that's true. And I'm not going to be putting myself out there saying that I'm a disbeliever. I just hope we're all wrong. I hope yeah. that everybody that thinks it's as deadly as it is, that they're all wrong. Yeah. I think whatever regardless is going to happen, I think by the time November happens, no matter what happens, I think this is going to become less of an issue um, because of whoever wins in office or whatever happens.
but uh, that's just my guess. Uneducated, math major, not not a part of bacteria or has any degree in medical. That's just my thought. Right. Could be wrong. Right. Yes. So where are you? Uh, where are you working out these days? Cobra Command CrossFit. So we're back to CrossFit, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I'm working out in a gym that my buddy owns and operates. Where is um, it? Uh, and so we're right in Baser, Kansas. We're Kansas City, okay. Kansas. We're like 35 minutes from the airport, pretty much. Okay. So that's the gym that I work out every day, work from. And that's pretty much it. I used to uh, the one when at one point Stanford's was out at the Legends. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's that's and, like 10 minutes away. Okay, so I yeah. So the house I bought is like nine. The, the property I'm going to own is like nine minutes away from Legends. Okay, do you know that water slide at the Legends at Water Park? There's a little water. Park uh, the there. one that the one that's like had the the ride that got shut down. Yeah. Did it get shut down? Why? Schlitter bonds. Yeah, they had a Schlitter bonds. Terrible name. Built the tallest water slide in the world. It was the no the longest drop, the most vertical drop. Doesn't matter. Whatever the heck it is. Okay. So it was like way the crap up there. Super steep drop. Never did it. Okay. Well, uh, they put you in this like thing to send you down this thing or whatever. And they decide to like open up, the, you know how usually they're plastic tubes? Yeah. Well, they decided to open up a part of it and put cargo netting. And they told you, uh, keep your hands and body inside the oh, tube. No. It's going fast as crap, right? Yeah. Well, uh, it was open for almost a year. I don't know how long it was open for, a couple months to a year. And they had one kid who went down with his sister or something. It was a boy and a girl who went down. Um, but for whatever reason, kid sat up or put his head up, got his head stuck and decapitated them on the ride. Oh! Yeah, yeah, And so the worst part was, well, it's bad someone died, but for the <laughs> bad part for the water park was that it was a can, that that day the, the whole park was closed and was only open to like Kansas legislators. And so the kid who died, like his dad was high up there or something and that park that ride got shut down like that it's now gone the park's still open i think uh, but yeah it was pretty bad because i remember they have the funnel one which is like which <laughs> i've ridden at another one of those wolf wolf something uh wolf watches wolf lodge my wife was like come on let's go her and her friend we got in this raft and i was like what is this and it's like you shoot down something and then up into this funnel it's like a half pipe and you shoot up both sides of the half pipe but I heard it was one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life. My, and I've, done, I've jumped out of airplanes and bungee jumped and done everything. My wife's friend screamed a blood curdling scream that I think only women have screamed when they've lost a child. Like it was the, I, her scream scared me so badly that I was like, we're all dying. All three of us just, we right just dropped, here, right our, now. We dropped our death. Daniel Tosh has the funniest joke. It's a terrible joke. But it's, uh, it's a story about <laughs> a guy was on a roller coaster, one of those roller coasters that you hang from, you know, mm -hmm. like, like they, they, they bolt you in and yeah. your feet dangle. Yeah. And uh, somebody walked underneath the roller coaster, and, like on the other side of the fence or something, and the person kicked them in the head as the roller coaster came by and killed them. And they broke their <gasps> ankle. And he's like, terrible, terrible. He goes, but imagine being that person. Because everyone they run into wants to know, how'd you break your ankle? <laughs> oh, gosh, it's a terrible, that's terrible. Poor guy. Oh, that, yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah, that's awful. Um, all right, so, um, so who, who, who's all in and who's all out for, uh, for the games this year? Uh, I think everyone who was out is now, is now all back in. So um, everybody everyone. competing wise, there's, wait, so is it 20 are going in the 20. online? 20. 20, 20 online, online open qualifiers and 10 sanctional athletes. So okay. 30 total. Okay. So 30 total. Um, nothing, nothing gets you grandfathered from the year before. I think that's, I, I kind of feel, I feel like you, if you won something, you should get a grandfather in, but, uh, uh, how do you feel you are this year compared to next last year? Yeah, last year I went in with a little bit of a knee injury. And so me, them snatching, squat snatching the first workout, I hadn't squatted in like a couple weeks leading into that. And so I feel a lot better. I mean, this year it's going to be here, right? We're going to do it right. here. 
And then we're from here, we'll go there if I qualify. So it'll be different. It's, I mean, it's not going to be the greatest. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not my number one pick. I'd rather go to Aromas. So, I mean, cause like you're obviously limited. Do you do better with, you can... do you do better with competition around you? Well, sure. I think we all do better with competition around us regardless, but I think I would do better there because of the, the equipment and movements that they'll allow you to do. Right. So, you know, like you go in person, they'll let you run. We can do rope climbs. We can do odd object. We can do hill sprints. We can do all these different things in aromas that now you're going to be limited to very open esque. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so as soon as they announce that, Hey, we're not, we're doing an online qualifier my training changes to reflect the fact of the open kind of concept because right. it's going to be similar to that. It's not going to be, I don't need a ruck run. I don't need to swim right now. You know? And are so you better? Are you better at like, I'm a big fan of like, I say the CrossFit game should be uh, you guys train the way you train, but then you come to the games and it's all stuff you've never done in your life. Like they're like, here's a refrigerator, run it around a track, you know, like, how are you going to get it there? And you're like odd objects that you've never picked up before, weird kind of hills that you've never practiced on, things that are going to put you in situations to prove that you're, you're fit, you're not skilled. And I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think it's cross, it's cross skill, it's cross fit. And if we're going to see your fitness level, it, it actually could probably be dialed down by VO2 max, by strength, by all these things. But like things like the snatch, which we talk about, you know, which takes – tons and tons and tons of practice and practice to be efficient at it and and skillful at it where a lot of these other things are just brute strength and and cardiovascular fitness and um so i like whenever they do something like we're gonna fill up a wheelbarrow full of sandbags and throw them over and are you one of those guys that's where you excel yeah yeah because i've used the wheelbarrow in my life yeah, you're just, a just to poke fun of Noah. I don't think Noah had used the wheelbarrow, <laughs> and so when he got there. I love to clarify. I love Noah to death, but so when he got there, it's like, I mean, I grew up on a farm. It was a wheelbarrow. Yeah. But uh, um, anyways, um, but yeah, I think they're these odd objects are fun. Like, I mean, I think that would be a cool one in the past to do again, which I think would be cool. California can do it because of the topsoil it has. We couldn't do it here in Kansas because of or low topsoil, but in 20, geez, 2009, I don't know what it was. They did like a 500 meter row and then you had the stake and you had to put the stake in the ground. Yeah. So like a stake drive, like I get the whole, like they hit the thing, oh, what, the, what was it? The double banger they used yeah. the pass with slides. Yeah. Eh, whatever. The people who are going to drag it, give them a freaking stake. That's functional. Give them a T post. Have them drive a T-post in the ground with a T-post driver, and then we'll see who uses their fitness. Yeah. But, yeah, it would be fun to do for sure. It'd be, it'd be cool. Well, I like it. That's, a, you know, I'm, I'm buddies with Tommy Hackenbrook, and he seems like one of those guys that just yeah. – he excels in things where it's, you know, not your normal or typical. And, a typical uh, gym movement. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I like to see that because I, I want people – I thought CrossFit was a great way to get fit to do other things. And when it became a sport, it was like, well, at least make it exemplary of that. Not, yeah. you know, and it became people CrossFit to CrossFit. And it was like, well, you know, that's, you know, we're competitive exercising again. Let's take guys that use their exercise to become great at everything. Because that's what was so great about CrossFit, that you could then do all these other things. Yeah. And, uh you know, I, I think they've been good with that. They add a couple and the game starts to get, you know, obstacle courses and things like that. And they're, they're more fun to watch than anything else. You know, when you watch, you know, Mary or Helen or something, unless, I don't know, those are, they're kind of fun, but you know, when you have giant forearms like you, long forearms and you can't do handstand push-ups. I had to get it out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't come back in this online qualifier. I'm going to, I know. I was, I was. I don't think they'd ever let that happen because of that. Such a weird thing. Yeah. I was like, okay, you're gonna do it on my hands and measure my forms. Cool. I'm gonna do it on my fists. Now let's see if you want to say something about it. Like, what, 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 what is the thing again? I, I, I knew this whole situation, but what is it again? Your, what is long on you? Your forearms? Well, well, it's it's not necessarily the the idea is defined terms. Like it's not long. It's just long in comparison to the rest of my arms. So like. What they're doing is they're saying, okay, 
let's measure how long your forearm is and then let's base how far you should go up on a handstand push-up. Okay. Well, that's like me telling you, hey, solve this equation and there's two variables. You're like, I can't solve it. I can give you a range, but I can't solve it. So it's great because they're, I mean, what they're saying is let's measure this portion of your arm and say how high you need to go. Well, they're taking out of con concern how big this portion of your arm, how long it is. It's, right, it's right. again, right, solving right. an equation with two, with two variables. You can't do right. it. I mean, did you, did you protest that at all? I mean, I said I didn't agree with it, but I mean, protest. No, I just said this was not well thought out. <laughs> yeah. Which probably didn't go over very well. Yeah. Um, but then they brought it back and I, I thought to myself, they're going to bring this back. I said, you know what? There's nothing in the rules that says I can't do it on my fists, which gives me an extra like half an inch to an inch. But granted, it's a deficit now. It's a deficit handstand push up for me. Right. Um, right. So it makes it more difficult, but it gives me height on that stupid line because of my forearms. Do you and practice so, on your fists now? Don't lie. No, no, okay. I only do it for the open. I mean, we might now because right. it might be coming out, but like, I don't do it during the year. I did it leading up to it to say, if this comes out, I want to be prepared for it. Oh, so you, you know, how you can do them on your fists. Yeah, I did it this year's open on my fist. The handstand oh, really? workout with 21.59 of deadlift and handstand pushups. I did it on my fists, all of it. It was, it was hard, it was painful. But yeah, I was gonna say that, that would be really rough. Not fun. <laughs> It's it, it well. I've I've been campaigning for the last six years to get the handstand push up taken out of CrossFit. Yeah, it's one of the most difficult movements to judge. Um, there's a lot of leeway in it, um, and there's just no way like a, a push press a barbell makes more sense because it goes overhead. But like you're you're a, uh, a competitive athlete and are really good at it. But I say for the average gym goer, it's a dangerous movement. Um, there's too much spinal compression. I think, you know, people coming down slipping or, sure. you know, not being able to like going to exertion and all of a sudden their muscle fatiguing and them giving out and coming down on their head on, even if you're it's on an good. ab mat, it's not good for your spine. That's not. Yeah. Like, and so just do a push press instead, you know, like. Yeah, that, that's what just, I would say. And so I just don't understand that. Yes, there's a lot of dangerous movements in CrossFit. I just think that's one where you're, you're really going to fuck up your spine. And I, yeah, and, sure. and I talked about it and had enough people write in that said, oh my God, this happened to me. I, I, I broke, you know, I, I slipped the disc from it. I, this, I, that, and it, they came in endlessly. I mean, it, I, I've got so much feedback on that, that it's like, guys, it's a dumb move. It's not worth it. It's one movement. Don't have that much pride. Just get rid of it. And yeah. well, maybe, maybe let do. the. Maybe let the competitive guys do it, but I just, and I don't see it. I, I, I see, think most gym owners are smart enough and I don't see them, uh, you know, prescribing any workouts anymore. So I'm glad to see that. We do. Oh, do you? Oh yeah. I mean, if they're going to use it in the open, why not? But, I but mean, I'm why? saying that you, yeah, again, you're going, oh, you're saying because the open, I don't, yeah. fuck the open. Yeah, um, yeah that's going to happen. But the dumb shit Hunter had me doing yesterday. Uh, <laughs> I, I, the whole day I was going, I'm going to be hurt tomorrow and I'm going to be so fucking mad at him. I'm going to be so mad at Hunter McIntyre. Um, hey, I've got, I, I've got five minutes, then I got to jump. Good. Well, I was just about to end it. I needed you to do, we do paint it forward every week. Someone gives okay. a workout. Uh, I forget what uh, Noah Olson's was. Noah's was brutal and you could only get through like one round of it. Uh, and he only got through like one round and a couple things. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, I like them. They're funny. Uh, like you just said to me, 600 handstand pushups for time. Uh, uh, no, Logan Aldrich, the one arm crossfitter. Yeah. He, ga he gave us your body weight deadlift up to 200 and I think it was 200 reps. And you start with one rep, two reps, three reps, four reps, five up till 200 i think it's like 21 reps or something or 21 oh, no. 21 sets you have to do also yesterday we did yesterday we did 30 shoulder overhead at i'm um, sorry clarification 30 push press at 135 and 95 uh 15 muscle ups and a 500 meter row and then you go back through it 20 push press at the same weight 10 muscle ups, 500 meter row. And then finally, uh, 10, five and 500 meter row. And the time cap is 
10 minutes. That's what we did yesterday. Okay, so that is your paint it forward. Um, That's my paint it forward. Somebody, somebody gave us one yesterday that was brutal. They wanted like a hundred. I lost it. I've lost everything on my email. I don't yeah, but here's the thing is like these people might give you a brutal workout. No is an exception, but they might give you a brutal workout and they've never actually done it. Like, no, I this, guy, this, this, guy, this guy did it. And uh, I've got to find it before we go. Um, he, he sent it to me or well, sent it to the Wadcast account and uh, oh, here it is. Freedom 1776. Um, he did this one and I can't, wearing a 30 pound vest, uh, 100 FB sit ups. I don't know what FB is. 100 push ups, 100 air squats, 100 speed ropes or double unders, 100 seal flutter kicks, 100 air dine reps. I guess that would that mean calories? I would say. Yeah. yeah. 100 snatches at 95, 100 crunches, 100 jump ropes, 100 air dine reps, 100 mountain climbers. 120 seal flutter kicks. Yeah. I mean, uh, now what was the I, intent? Like, I don't it's know. Like intensity over what? Like volume, just like a, an hour worth of work. <laughs> he said it was funny. I had a group of guys all ready to go and do this with me up until the morning of the workout. They all bailed <laughs> and I did it alone. I played songs about America and the national anthem a few times from a speaker. I carried in a backpack. People came out to take pictures with me and gave me water. Best fourth of July I can remember. Uh, so uh, uh, this is Damien Dambra. I don't understand. He said 5.56 run carrying the symbol of freedom wearing the 30 pound vest. I don't, I, I'd like to know what his time is. That's just that volume. You'd be sore for the rest of your life. No, yeah, absolutely. That's brutal. Yeah, dead. Um, that's a funny workout though. That is like us with our, with our race when we did our 68 mile race. And we're like, Hey, come on. Everybody's, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And like five people showed up. Nobody shows up for stuff like that. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, apparently they're doing it again. Has Hunter tried to recruit you? For a long race? No. He knows they don't run with him. Yeah, 68 miles. I did it with him last year. And uh, they're doing it again October 24th. If anybody is interested, message me at wadcastpodcast at yahoo.com. I might ride a mountain bike in it this year and not do it. Uh, it, was, it was brutal. I was hurting for like, I was like, it was like the flu afterwards. Uh, Jacob, Just thanks dead. for doing the show. Um, where can they find you? Yeah, so you can just Google me <laughs> or find me on Instagram. It's very easy. I'm probably the only, I think the only other Jacob Hepner who owns an Instagram handle like that lives in Asia. I've asked for his account handle and he won't give it to me. So. Oh, brutal, brutal. We can, we can, can follow terrorize him. In Asia. We, can, we can terrorize him. You want the fans here? I offered him $5. <laughs> oh yeah. Some guy tried to sell me Ift. He just like wrote to me. He's like, I own Ift.com. And I, you know, have eddieif.com and he goes, I'll sell yeah. it to you for $5,000. And I go, how about you just give me your address and I come over and beat the shit out of you. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for doing the show. Thanks for listening, everybody. Check us out everywhere. iTunes, YouTube now. Brandon, this is our first episode that's ever going to be YouTube. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, uh, and thank you, Jacob. And good luck. Good luck at the games. I'll be cheering thanks. for you. Uh, you're one of my favorites. So, uh, so we're hoping you, you crush it. Perfect. Uh, and thanks, thanks for doing the show.